Welcome back to our discussion. We have now more guests than before. We have uh, Rosi Praidotti on the screen. We have uh, Johannes as Pro Protectorama Generalis here with us today. And we have a new guest, uh, Sara Johanna Teurer. She is, um, she is a, um, a curator at the House der Kunst in Munich, which is a, which is a house for modern kunst, uh, modern art, sorry. sorry. We have to switch to English. <laughs> we just talked in German. And uh, she, is, uh, she hosts uh, Portals, which is a show on Kashmir Radio Berlin, focusing on process-oriented art practices. And as I know, you are a historian of art. This was your training, or? Uh, not exactly, no. <laughs> <laughs> we talk about this okay. a minute later. Yeah. So we had the very great talk by Lars. Uh, and we now know that we are living together with microbes and we hope that microbes will save us. And I want to make, uh, so during yesterday and today, listening to the talks, I found something which I think is very positive. So the good news, I think, of all the crises we, we are facing at the moment, and there are a lot of crises, I think, is that we become more and more aware. So when we maybe the older ones of us, when we look back 20 years ago, so we were not that aware about environmental issues or about other issues. So I think there is a collaborative learning at the moment pushed by the crisis, and this is, I think, a very positive thing. And I would like to ask uh, Rosi how you see that. So do you see that, or would you share my idea that we see a new awareness and that this is something which is a very good news? So, hello everybody, nice to be here, and hello to the audience, uh, great that you're so loyal to us. Um, so, it, it, it depends a bit on uh, who the we is. It is absolutely true uh, of the university, of, of the research community, that that um, the question of the, the, the environment was taken for granted. It's not something that um, was primary <clears throat> in, in, in the humanities and social sciences. The humanities and social sciences are very anthropocentric. We study human beings. We study the identities of humans, the suffering of humans, the revendications of humans, particularly in critical theory. And critical theory was very, the left, very, very uh, anthropocentric. And I, I mentioned briefly last night the bad relationship between green politics and red politics. Um, not, not very uh, friendly. Uh, I remember very major American feminist when I was a graduate student uh, coming up to me and saying, I'm glad that you're doing philosophy of subjectivity because there are so many people out there that are soft in the head. And being soft in the head meant that you did environmental things. You were a tree hugger. Uh, you did these ridiculous things. So I think there's something about critical theory and um, not taking in the pain of the world and, and prioritizing the, the pain of humans. Uh, and I think that makes the humanities and social sciences today a little bit more um, old fashioned than life sciences and biotechnologies. We heard Lars talk about the fact that our bodies are colonies of bacteria. You know, so even the idea, my body, myself, our bodies, ourselves, colonies of bacteria. And we heard, um, uh, Johannes talk about the, the multiplicities of possible levels um, of selves and becoming. So multiplicities and complexities don't go easily with a certain traditional critical theory. So I think indeed we've come a long way. We are learning, but you know, Rachel Carson, the, the, the Silent Spring is 1961. Mm. Um, the third ecofeminism, Francoise Dubon, is 1974. So the, the, the ideas and the theories were there. They just didn't resonate. We, we have come a long way in that respect. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So, and I think so. The um, you said it. Mu multiplicity is a very important, um, a very important topic. And what is what really interests me in is the discussion between Lars and Protectorama, because you have the experience of multiplicity yourself as, as you are and as, what is the plural, as you, of you, as, as we are? No, uh, you said it yesterday so nicely. I as Lars. And Lars is doing this, the research about it, so this would be a very nice um, experience to learn more about. Well, I, I would like to add as us, and I think it might have become clear in 
for example, the question and answer yesterday is that I struggle to speak as us. Even though this is what I do, it's a struggle. It's not easy to decenter yourself as many. Um, and it's, it's a practice. It's a practice that is continuous and it's, um, it has setbacks and it has failures. And then it's like these moments, like these two days here where I can fully embody the multiplicity, but then there is like the everyday life in which you know we are we as us are recentered into this subject into this identity that's fixed and that's stable and it has to be stable before functioning right and i think that's maybe a, a kind of uh, a throw to you like these functions these functionalities these solutions that we as humans develop in order to stabilize ourselves to fix ourselves to make ourselves selves I think these are these are these are basically also in what the the questions were posed to you are at the center I think of what we are grappling with all of us as humans mm. is like we have made a world that functions that is effective that is fast that it's growing but it's truly sick and it's truly um dying and I think in order to revert that and make a world that's not functioning and that's complicated and that's multiple and that's like really complicated, we have to revert our whole thinking, not just the thinking, the theory, but ourselves as selves, as stable, fixed, stable identities. And this is, this is something that's a struggle. It's not going to be easy. And so I, as us, also fail and um, uh, yeah, crumble. <laughs> Lost? You like to add something? Yeah, um, I'm uh, just in these two days exposed to so many new ideas and uh, aspects. I, yeah, I, I see that I'm uh, my thinking is very, uh, very <laughs> let's call it positive focused, but um, I, I guess um, with a lot of um, yeah, missing a, a lot of points. Um, yeah. Um, how um, we live healthy with our microbes. Um, they even now, um, because we, we, we get technologies that we can actually learn with whom we live. There are now um, uh, companies out there, they, they sell us essays, they uh, sell us information uh, for 60 euros, 80 euros, and they try to tell us um, maybe uh, who, who is living with us and what is healthy and what not, but uh, one has to admit, uh, we just don't know. Um, and at the moment, there's a lot of correlation. Uh, we, uh, th there are even some people saying that, um, that humankind is getting heavier all the time. Um, it's, it's, it's a disease um, because we just have the wrong microbes and we uh, uh, get more carbon into our body. Um, which uh, people previously wouldn't have got because it's an infection. I'm, I'm more on a chemical engineer. I'm, I think it's a carbon balance. And if you eat too much, then you get bigger, maybe. But um, so, so, so we will learn in the next years, um, uh, decades. Um, but at the moment, uh, we, we know more about disease. So if we have single microbes, that's not good. If we, if we have a multiple a lot of different microbes it's often better yeah but i mean the the interesting aspect is that yesterday we heard talks about the global scale of 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 collaborative thinking and be open and, and so on this is a very interesting view into the micro scale that we also share a lot and that we are aware of and i think in in your performance you 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 presented it so perfectly this this uh, which is a, in a way a, a chain between these two scales, which, which is interesting, I think. And I want to ask Sarah, I mean, you, you know more about, uh, you, um, about Johannes as Protectorama and so on work, uh, how you see this, how difficult for an artist it is to, to, to switch these identities. Mm. I think it's not only difficult for artists <laughs> um, <laughs> to begin with, um, um, I think, obviously, as an artistic practice, 
Um, so we see that as a sort of narration and um, artistic practice, right? Um, as a potential reality or as something that is suggested um, and that people can engage with by suspending of disbelief. Um, so maybe this is the easiest way to engage with these kind of thinking. Um, and I was just, um, I hope that's not too heretical, but I was just thinking when you were talking um, about these like um, microbes that look like animals that I think they're not that different actually to what um, Protectorama uh, might <laughs> present to us as in terms of complexity or as, you know, a multiplied being. Um, but they're like almost like Tamagotchis. I mean, they look like pets. And this is something um, where, where I see um, a problem maybe or a question that I would like to pose. And um, because they are like pets and you were saying also we teach the microbes something, I was reminded of this child metaphor that we often imply also when we think about AI and art, but also um, in our relation to it. And since we're talking about social orders and communities, is this a healthy relationship if we think about them as children or <laughs> not? <laughs> yeah, I, may, maybe I should uh, turn them around because uh, <laughs> these eyes are very... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> obviously, you have seen also the electron microscopy. That's why I thought this was important as well. Um, there are uh, some structures where some microbes, also on that scale, uh, can uh, detect where the light comes from. They can orientate themselves in the direction of sun. It's not an eye, but it's a, it's a protein. Uh, but most of the, and, and for sure they don't have eyes like this. Um, so, um, but um, yeah, for, for me, um, also the sheer number we have in one reactor, or if you buy your yeast as a, as a cube, these 30 grams, if you count how many cells you have and you put in an oven, um, uh, before they obviously make a nice bread, um, I don't see uh, um, an issue there <laughs> at all. Um, and that's why, um, yeah, I don't have uh, also an issue with... Uh, May I come them. in on this? as yeah. the non-artist the non in the group. Um, I was wondering, as I heard all of you speak, but uh, particularly the, the curator, the, the artist, what has changed since the postmodern era? I mean, it's not the first time that we sit around talking about the instability of identities, about multiplicities and complexities. And yet something has shifted tremendously from when we did that back um, in the old days when you know multiple identities, in my case, nomadic identities, uh, flows and processes. Could we try to see what, what has changed? Um, it, one is the scale, I think. Um, uh, a bacteria is not one bacteria, it's a colony. There are multitudes of them. We know that bacteria are eating out those plastic bottles in the southern oceans, they're eating away at them, and they're extraordinary, unstoppable, um, and really and, and inexhaustible, and, go, and always collectivity. So we know that a lot of that is going on. So is the scale what changes between Baudrillard and us, between postmodernism and what I call the posthuman moment? Is it the fact that now science is an interlocutor? We have Lars telling us how things really are. In the 80s and 90s, we wouldn't have had a scientist telling us how it really works. In fact, we wouldn't have cared. Now, it was linguistic, it was cultural. Could we try to play with that? And ultimately the question is for Protectorama at the end of the day. Oh, okay. I'm, as us, I'm maybe not capable to, to have that sound trajectory as you were proposing. I really, I'm, I'm very entertained by it or like inspired by this by this question, but I don't think I can I can really answer it. I can I can only make a a more profound like sort of delineation of what space I think we have here that you describe, like that we now share with scientists, we share with um, engineers, we share in in the case of for example, artificial intelligence. And in that, the paradigms have shifted. The artists are not maybe that independent anymore and that careless, as 
you were describing, or, the, or also the humanities. And also we have the science um, not being as positive as it was. I think that's right. So, but where is that space where that happens? We can say it's here, but there's few spaces where this can happen. And maybe it's a question of scale in terms of scaling up these spaces in which these um, hybridizations, these, um, these uh, unclear, unreadable, um, anti-discipline moments can, um, can uh, be nurtured. I don't know, it was maybe no. just a doubling down on what you said. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <clears throat> I think so what, uh, what I see when you ask, uh, Rosie, what, what is changing, I think that what we see is in the, the an emerging of, the, uh, of a kind of a global sensibility. And I think we, we deal with a lot of global problems, but we have no global sense for it because we are here and now, and that is good for it, but we need to have more a global sensitivity in a way. And because you said, so artists joining scientists is a very important thing because when I, what I liked in your talk, Lars, was not only that you are so much in favor of uh, microbes, but that you very often said, um, this is another aspect of it. This is another aspect of it. This is another aspect of it. And I think this is also a, a, a sign for multiplicity, which science can, can give us. So to look very carefully and to look at these different aspects um, and, and to give us the insight into these different aspects, which is very important because we need the scientists. You have to do all the work to give us these insights, you know, we can't, we can't do this work. On the other hand, we see then from the artist side how you can, um, you, you, can, um, you can use it in order to make it more sensible. In a, I don't know how, if, if you can follow me, but uh, we have no sense for this. We only have rhetorics for it. And this is something we also have to think about, new forms of rhetoric about talking about these things, I think because the rhetoric at the end of the day, Rosie, uh, keeps us in this sometimes very uh, old uh, uh, borders of thinking. That is what I, what I feel pretty much, but I have no idea how we could develop a new rhetoric in order to deal with it. Maybe you have an idea, Rosie. New rhetoric about the, the collaborative assemblages. Well, it's, um, it's I think the, it's where the question of experimenting with thinking becomes crucial. Um, and uh, uh, th that's why thinking is what I, I continue to foreground. And it is a creative as well as, as a critical. We need, to, we need fundamental labs to think about complex multiplicities, to think about metastability, to think about new modes of heterogeneous collaboration, we really need to, to have much more a time and structures and resources to, to work on thinking um, in an era that is completely opposed to theory, totally opposed to a research in the humanities and culture, at least in the universities, in the teaching world. And so we rely more and more in what used to be called the arts world, which is the world we're experimenting with thinking to a certain extent, always happened. This is why I asked what, what has changed since, since the postmodern era. And uh, in a sense, it always happened, but now it's accelerating more, more than ever as the universities become more uh, kind of industrialized, and as knowledge becomes monetarized, and as re getting research funding means finding money for your research. And as the institutions become that way, it is the, the, the arts and cultural sector that is where experimenting with thinking uh, takes place. Um, and it's a very strange tension and one that has been exacerbated, of course, by the pandemic, where there is a huge emergency. We have to find a solution um, and it almost overrides any other consideration. Um, um, so I, it, I think um, asking for respect for experimental ways of thinking and putting resources to it, um, completely against the, the, the stream uh, of what is happening. And again, there are connections to the past. This was a request, I mean, Deleuze wrote in the 80s 
uh, philosophy is about the creation of new concepts. It's about creativity. The modernists were talking about, do we have a language to express um, our new industrial culture? There are continuities and profound discontinuities with modernity that we need to, to map out as we enter this posthuman, non-human um, kind of universe. Sometimes I think that we are running out of time, that we will not have the resources to do this. Um, uh, is certainly not in the institutions of learning. Um, but then, of course, uh, there is Zollverein and there are other institutional settings. Uh, but we, we need to intensify, we need to ask what is the institutional structure that we need for experimenting with new ways of thinking? It's, it's what the question that you people are asking, really. <laughs> yes. I mean, I, 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 what I see, we had a summer school last year with a lot of uh, Asian students and it was very interesting and I see it, but I see it also in Europe, that the universities, especially the technological universities, go from this linear thinking into circular thinking, which is, I think, a very good sign. Uh, to think about technology in a circular way, that, uh, re that uh, the things are renewable, that you have to be more sensitive. So that is something you also mentioned, that circular thinking is a very important aspect of it. It's not the only aspect, but it's a very important aspect. Oh? Yep. Uh, I, I fully agree. Um, and uh, this also then suddenly requires a lot of collaboration. Um, uh, usually, um, uh, it was uh, in a in a single. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. We, we didn't think ab much about it about the consequences in engineering, um, and uh, suddenly we we have to think of end of life. Uh, we we see it in our research that we look at uh, customer perception. Um, we, we we have these examples uh, huge. Di uh, PR disasters of, of again, my biofuel example yeah. in Germany. Uh, it was well meant. Uh, it was no problem for the environment. Uh, there was a technology. It was not too costly. It's actually even cheaper. Uh, it's subsidized in Germany, but no one buys it because uh, it was a full PR disaster. Uh, so uh, if you think circular, uh, you, you have to talk with other people. Yeah. And um, I guess uh, it's a good idea to be trained uh, as a student, I, I agree. Um, and we, we see shifts also in our curricula, but it's, it's not fast. It's not fast either. If I may ask Lars, because I loved uh, the way you approached the whole issue of the, as far as I can understand that the, the, the collective nature of the bacterial colonies, the kind of immense vitality of this matter, uh, Lynn Margulies is, is really, for me, a very crucial figure in this, but you are very aware of what a difficult life Lynn Margulies had when Richard Dawkins and the official biogenetics community accused her of being basically wrong, um, of, of, of being a bad poet with her symbiotic life and her circular thinking. And there's a, if you look at the, at the documentary on Lynn Margulies, you literally hear Richard Dawkins saying to Margulies, but why are you talking about life as a holistic process of collaboration? And, uh, with the selfish gene theory, we have the perfect theory to understand the linear evolution of the European man, uh, we have a system that protects and defends our market economy. Lynn, why do you want to change this? And Lynn Margulies answers to the great Richard Dawkins, because, Richard, the evidence is out there. <laughs> uh, and I think that moment where you get what is the scientific truth, what counts as the scientific truth, it is still very, very difficult to defeat linearity uh, in biological thinking, in scientific thinking. And the, the battle is still on. It's shifting, I agree, but long way to go still. Um, yeah. and, and we could do the same thing for brain research. If you listen to Steve Pinker, it's all very linear and all very rational and all very teleological. Uh, as the evidence from everywhere else is the, the messiness, the, the, the circularity and the relational mess, really, the relational entanglements, as Karen Barad would say. So don't you think that you are in some ways a very revolutionary thinker, Lars, in going in that direction? Maybe you're freer than, than, than most. Yeah, um, <laughs> thanks. Uh, I, I, 
I haven't thought it. <laughs> uh, so, um, so these two days are really, uh, yeah, teaching me a lot. Uh, but, but what I see uh, also, uh, how did microbiology work uh, at least uh, last 120 years ago, uh, maybe 150 years, uh, trying to isolate this single uh, microbe and work with it? It was a bad pathogen. It was a good uh, baker's yeast. And uh, for the last 10 years or so, we try really to understand communication. Okay, communication, we, we try to understand maybe the last 30 years, but it's complicated. Um, but we try to understand uh, also uh, communities. And this is a big shift, but we see it's really important um, from uh, producing a cheese, this is often not a single a microbe, to us um, where we have thousands of different species living with us and we obviously don't know uh, how that works. But there is a shift uh, also in the research. Mm -hmm. Do we have uh, questions from... Yes, we have a few. Um, let me just pick one quickly. Um, So um, this one comes from uh, Shinit, from our participants, and she is asking about the position of, I think, um, biotechnology at this moment. She says, also keeping what Rosi has uh, said last night about not shying away from complexity, last do you find that you have to cheerlead for microbes, especially in a COVID landscape? Or do you feel that scientific communities allow for a non-black and white discussion? And maybe there would be another question that links to that from our website, um, which is, do you think that there would be change when people um, would not lack belief in the same way that they did in science, politics, etc., and creat creativity would become viable in its legitimacy and so would collectivity and micro-grinding. So what would change if people would um, trust in creativity the same way they do in science? Okay, my argument w would be that it's not either or. Um, uh, you don't get progress, I would say, um, if you don't have creativity. Um, you have to ask also the right questions. Um, that would be, um, yeah my direct reflex, um, but um, the, the other aspect, um, yeah, as a microbiologist, um, we, we uh, obviously face also reality and then it's not black and white. Um, um, at the moment, we produce most of our um, products via uh, chemical means and uh, the chemical industry um, will obviously go on and the chemists are uh, also creative uh, coming up with uh, more sustainable synthesis routes. Maybe they can also use other carbon sources. They can. Um, so uh, it will be not all microbes at the end. Um, so I think the discussion is out there. Uh, we try to evaluate it, uh, how much energy is required, what are the impacts on the, on the landscape if we take up new technologies that was discussed also yesterday, what, what happens if, if you just change? Uh, is that all the time better? Um, there are all the examples where it might not. Um, so I, th I think the discussion is open and hopefully the best ideas uh, um, win and uh, contribute um, that we come into something circular. But again, uh, is a, a rate is a time, uh, are we fast enough? Yeah. But um, do you think, so I like what Rosie yesterday said, that um, uh, we, we have this fear of climate change, but it's a Western fear because there are so many communities who have faced uh, catastrophes for so long and they are more resilient to uh, all this, uh, all this um, talking about climate change. So maybe only we are very aware or very uh, fearful of the climate change because the way we live is changing. Um, but is there not a similar thing that we that we also have the very Western feeling that we will fix the problem 
and um, and are there other ways? So this is just a question which came up with your answer now. Yeah. Um, so do you see any sign that um, solutions come from 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 other unexpected um, areas? Um, I I would like to kind of try to contribute something there because I do not think that the the even the idea of fixing it is fixed. <laughs> um, yes. Sorry to say, but I think this is really like taking from from also Rosi staying with the complexity and em em embracing it means to first acknowledge, and I think we as Westerners have to do a lot of work there, that we don't know anything, that we are really in a situation in which the complexity is growing, like we know more, we know deeper, but we know not wider. We don't know where we are. Like you were just giving this beautiful example of how we don't even know who's in us, who's sort of like how we are comprised of these millions of beings. That might be a bit kitschig, as we say in German, but I think it's a great metaphor, it's a great picture, it's a great image of how different our consciousness is to what we think we are and what we actually are. And I think this is what we first have to embody is that we don't know that we are in a blind flight and I mean specifically on a planetary scale. In when Johannes was a bit younger, he was um, talking to Norbert Trenkle, who's, a, who's um, working in the group Crisis, and he tried to, um, to like imagine a world society without money, which is obviously um, uh, not such a new idea, you know, if we look at the modernist ideas of getting rid of profit, of surplus value, of value as such, and this is also his history, but he was basically asserting that's the only thing Johannes got from this text, and he transposes it to me now, is like, we are in blind flight of how to even steer our economy, and I think that's pretty much what you also were illustrating, we don't know if the best ideas win, and we don't even know what's best. And I think that's, that's something we in the West have to really face, is with all that technology and all of this deep knowledge into deep systems of energy production, of microbiomes, of technologies, on a large scale, on a wide knowledge scale, we have no clue. And I think this is how to fix it, is to first embody that. And then we'll see. Thanks. Rosie, do you want to add something? Well, the Socratic not knowing is, of course, the beginning of all wisdom. But, it's, but we are in a, in a complicated convergence because I totally agree with Protector Rama that on the one hand, we don't have a clue how to fix this if the scale of the climate change if the, the, the melting of the permafrost means that the gas methane starts going into the atmosphere, well, that's irreversible. And that seems the process seems to have started and we don't know how to fix it. Uh, but at the same time, and it is the end end of complete capitalism and schizophrenia. At the same time, we have geoengineering projects that are coming up with the most extraordinary ways in which we could fix the problem by spraying things into the atmosphere, by protecting uh, the glaciers with layers of chemical material that would protect them. We have projects, serious projects with serious funding to mine minerals from the bottom of the oceans. We are sending probes out to Mars with the purpose of mining, of bringing down water. And it is all happening at the same time, extraordinary advances. Again, really extraterrestrial capitalism with enormous investments while we can't fix the quality of our air and our, our, and our water is that tension. I mean, synthetic biology, regenerative medicine, but at the same time, the labor that the Protector Emma pointed out so well, the labor of surrogacy, gestational labor, real primordial bodily labor. It's, we're really in a moment of end, end. I think we need a massive communal, a communitarian, community-driven effort to steer the process and say, okay, 
okay, fine to mine, to send, you know, uh, spaceships to Mars because it has minerals that we need. But can we maybe take care of this planet also? At the end of the day, it's it's the notion of caring for this for this planet and caring for the people that are paying the heaviest price um, for being so close to the toxic material of the earth. It's a, it's a question of solidarity, of responsibility. It's pretty one on one. But at the same time, there's a lot that we know, but very little that we give a damn for. And I think that that, that is what really worries me. That's what keeps me awake at night. <laughs> okay. So, but this is what I mean when we, we don't have a sense for it in a way. So it is very nice to see a spaceship starting to Mars. This is exciting, you know, uh, this is thrilling in a way. We like that, but caring is, has not this thrilling part. And, uh, and, it's, uh, and we need to have more a sense for that uh, in, in order, uh, in contrast to, to, to have this thrilling aspect of, of seeing um, rocket start. I think it has a lot to do with feelings, with emotions and, uh, and, and these things. Um, I don't know, maybe you can... Yeah, may maybe that's hmm, where you already introduced me as a curator where I wouldn't even want to claim that uh, position to speak from. Um, that's why I said I think I identified as a practitioner <laughs> or something of techno-social techniques, um, meaning with this curating or making exhibitions. Um, or facilitating relations or something. Um, and I think maybe this is where art, when we think of embodied knowledge or exhibition making, um, can suggest um, a horizon to think in. Mm -hmm. um, I would actually be interested also in uh, Rosie Bradotti's notion in the um, nomadic subject and how this uh, goes together with a root, more rooted or um, yeah, located embodied knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, because I think this is something that arts or facilitating arts is um, grappling with a lot at the moment, especially. Rosie, do you want to answer it? Yeah, it's a big question. <laughs> but, uh, um, to be in movement, to be uh, to be nomadic, actually, it's got a long, complicated history. But it, the root of it is numos. It comes from the land. It, it comes from being grounded and and situated. But that, but then you move. But you move between locations. Uh, it's it's not an endless drifting. It is it is um, itineraries and it is. Um, uh, motions and, and and I used it as a uh, with Deleuze, with Spinoza, with, with that phase of my, of my thinking to move beyond this idea of that being a subject means being really grounded, located, one equal to itself. And there was a real already a, an attempt to instability, to opening, and to variations that you can be many different things, contradicting things. Um, it was a transformation and transversality, uh, but it never was meant to be unhinged. My favorite line is from uh, Virginia Woolf, I am rooted, but I flow. I am grounded, but I move. I belong to multiple locations. Uh, my bacteria is as much me uh, as, as the synapses in my brains. Uh, we are a multiplicity. It was moving in that direction with, with um, uh, a kind of very little nostalgia for the sovereign transcendental notion of the subject, which is still so terribly important, the narcissism of that subject that is in charge of the course of his life. And the bloated narcissistic subject. Can I just add that when Felix Guattari back in, 19, ended in the 80s, early 90s, is writing one of the big treatises on ecology, the three ecologies, which is an extraordinary text about the ecologies of society, environmental and psychic, the affective, the social and the environmental, and is warning us that technology will go really down exactly the way that it went towards making money, profit, um, delusionality, and that it will infantilize us. It will make us dependent on patterns of communication and representation that are really bad for us. And yet we will keep going back for more like kids or like adults taking another shot 
of media-induced um, stupidity. And then he looks at the example. He, he says there is an example of the type of subject that represents where we are going. It's 1992, and Felix Guattari chooses Donald Trump as the example. Go and look it up in the three ecologies. <laughs> Prescient, uh, like they, 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 this kind of big baby with nuclear power. Um, and I think I think that no that sick, toxic subject is something that we have been fighting against, nomadic subjects of all kinds, for decades, forever. Um, a long way to go, but we have to have that flexibility, that openness, metastability, experimenting, not nostalgia. It's time to move on. Um, and, and I think, again, the, the, the artists, practitioners have done amazing work. The first posthuman exhibition is in Munich in 95. Uh, it's the first posthuman exhibition. It's 95. Um, it's very interesting, an incredibly interesting exhibition um, at, at, at the cusp between postmodernism and posthumanism. An extraordinary moment where already all of these ideas are are um, bursting open miles ahead of anything that we can do in philosophy departments or even in cultural studies departments. So complicated answer, but I wanted to throw it back at you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but the, I, I want to ask, come back to the question of rhetoric. So um, it's not one of the biggest problem, uh, especially of, of, of Western world, that we have only one word for me, because you, and, and this is something we learned yesterday so nicely, uh, I as, as we is so unusual, you have to get used to it. I, I once did a seminar in Berlin um, with, um, on language, on philosophy of language, and all the participants, the students came from Asia, and they have eight different forms for me related to the social environment. And, and, um, and this was so interesting because um, with this idea of eight different me's, you cannot develop uh, ego cogito ego sum from Descartes because there is not this single ego. Consequently, you can't invent yeah. modern science and consequently you can't invent colonialism and all the things that made the West what it was. Exactly. So that is the nucleus, you know. That is the yeah, nucleus. I agree. But you know, modernism, uh, James Joyce, Virginia Woolf, they already attack this. High modernism, you know, they, they write these books where there is no I. The waves of Virginia Woolf, wh wh what is the subject? It's actually yeah. things. And the waves is an extraordinary text. And so so it's, it's the, the experimentation with that goes into high modernism. And then it flops out and becomes a series of other things. I think the rise of technology, the rise of the media is absolutely crucial there. Yeah. Um, because in some ways, Facebook gives you a face, gives you a place, uh, reinstates your molecular um, molarity. You, you become a microfascist, um, uh, to quote my favorite philosophers, almost inevitably. So, so there is an effect of re-territorialization that comes from the technology, but we have prototypes of criticism of that unitary subject going way back to the to the first part of the 20th century. Again, literature and the arts. Um, yeah. So what was your experience in mm -hmm. Asia with that? Um, I didn't I didn't go into the specifics of linguistics, but I totally think that ISS comes or was at some point also uh, sort of shot through uh, what you were mentioning, these the the other linguistics that are different than from what I grew up with as Johannes, as Protectorama, becoming these multiplicities. Um, but there's also the way I as us have developed, there's also the question of is there not many more forms of we? And I think that's, mm -hmm. that's maybe crucial to add that also comes from certain linguistics um, different forms in different world languages to include or exclude people mm -hmm. from the we. And I think there is, there's almost algorithmic forms in some indigenous languages in Australia that, that um, basically kind of work in, work in derivatives of we as you progress through times. And it's incredibly inspiring, incredibly rich embodied knowledge that we can draw from these forms of linguistics and um, I, would, I would argue that um, what we 
see in uh, what Rosie just mentioned in the West is making the eye a technology, making it efficient, making it streamlined along the idea of disenchanting the world, making it less complex for this very mono identical or identitist eye. So you can exert power, you can exert colonial force, you can move through the universe as if you were one. And I think it's absolutely mm -hmm. crucial to revoice this again and again that this eye is a technology that we need to overcome. It's one of the pathogens, yep. if I may say so. Yeah, that, that, that is great. But we have one bacteria here and another, or microbe, is it a micro, uh, bacteria? It, it's and another often. one here. So this is the same idea embodied in this Plüschtiere. I don't know the English word for it. So last, I know that we talk always about a microbe, but you said there are colonies, there are millions, billions of it. And as a, so this is very scientific now. You, you have to talk quantitatively, so statistically about it, which is also challenging because it doesn't fit to the object-oriented thinking of the eye. Is, is this an experience you have as a scientist? Maybe I, I, I managed to, to come back to that. I, I had a, somehow an idea um, just when we um, look um, yeah, at our micro biome. So this is majorly, uh, if you look mass-wise um, into, into your gut, um, there's obviously skin, etc. Et there are also microbes everywhere. Um, it's a diversity. If there's suddenly one, uh, then suddenly even a baker sees their examples, suddenly even a baker sees is a pathogen. Um, if it's only a baker sees, there are patients out there, if they eat something sweet, what does a baker sees do? Produce ethanol, they're drunk when they eat some sweets. And um, so it's even their pathogen, if they lose most of their others. So um, if, yeah. That was just this um, individual to the community or to, to, to the mixture. Um, do you uh, do I have a? I, I think I can't make a <laughs> shift back um, to, to, to your uh, aspect. Um, then we leave no. it by that. Thank you all for this discussion. It was really interesting. Thank you for listening. <laughs>